Well, let's get right into the Word together today. And um, you can see we've already placed, put up here on the Scripture. Uh, I'll just put, let the first two Scriptures be up here on the board for us so we can just kind of move through them quickly. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And again, the reason I'm going to put these first two verses, this one out of Acts 2 and the next one out of Acts 5 up here, just simply because I want to continue to emphasize that what we're talking about here is we're talking about gifts and ministries and relational interaction in the body of Christ. Is we're, not, we're, we're, we're not trying to talk about creating something where everything happens in one service on Sunday morning or a service Sunday morning and a service Wednesday night. Many times when people have gotten a hold of the idea that the body of Christ was being actually uh, robbed of its opportunities to minister one another, as Paul has talked to us about uh, in this scripture, they think, well, the only way to remedy this is for everything to come into the house of God, to the, to the institutional facility in which we meet on Sunday mornings and try to pack everything into what would have to necessarily be a 24 to 72 hour service. And so what we're trying to do is relate the idea that the scripture carried that it was also a daily house to house communication of the gifts and the ministries that we have to one another. And then if we go over into the second or fifth chapter and daily in the temple, daily, see this word daily keeps occurring. And in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And we found out that when they, in the previous verse, that when they were together on a daily basis, they were breaking bread together. That does not mean mean, uh, I don't believe in the context that they were, that refers to taking communion the way we talk about breaking bread. They're talking about fellowship. They were talking about dining together, enjoying one another's presence, sharing, you know, what they had uh, with one another. And so we see that there was a lot going on daily. There was daily meetings in the temple. Daily they were meeting from house to house. They were teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They were breaking bread together. They were fellowshipping with one another. You can bet they were ministering healing and encouragement and, and, and uh, so on and so forth to one another. They were, they were uh, communicating the ministry of Jesus, what they had learned and experienced in, the, in traveling with Jesus. And remember, Jesus was not... Uh, just in the temple once a week or in the synagogue once a week. He was from place to place all week long. In every city and village it talked about. He was in the synagogues in every city and village, but he was also among the people, among the people, and he was demonstrating the love and the ministry of God everywhere he went. And so this first church was just simply reacting to the, to the uh, format that they had, had revealed to them. So, you see, I just want to make sure that we don't get caught up in this thing where we think, well, what we need to do is we need to toss out the institutional church. We need to quit gathering on Sundays and or Wednesdays, whatever we do. We need to go back into the, uh, into the house or we need to go out and we need to for form a farm commune somewhere and we need to withdraw. That's not at all the appropriate response. The appropriate response is let's let all things be done, as the scripture said. Let's continue to meet as they did in the synagogue. Let's continue to meet and gather together in places. You you know, let's use wisdom in the places that we buy and the money that we spend and that kind of th thing that has become bordered on foolishness at times. But let's continue to draw together like this in larger quantities and let's continue or begin to get together in smaller groups. Let's continue to, to or I mean, let's begin, I should say, to see the need to be involved in one another's lives on a daily basis. Now, obviously, every person can't be involved with every person every day. And from the beginning of this, we have talked about the principle from Hebrews chapter 10 and considering one another, right? One another. And so really, if, if we would just kind of uh, uh, get involved with one person, if each of us would just get involved with one person that we, to begin with, not, not, not as our, our goal or our final, you know, uh, end on this thing, but if we would just say, hey, you know what, I can get involved, I know there's one person I can get involved in, then I can encourage, I can strengthen, and then, and then I can also reciprocally, reciprocally receive from. So that, that's all I want to do is I want to make sure with these first two verses that you understand we're not trying to create... Um, to me, it would, be great, it would be greatly fearful. Oh my God, they want to do everything on Sunday. That would ruin Bronco season. It had its own ruin this year, but I mean, <laughs> in the future. Anyway, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, and um, we're going to look at verses 4 through 11 to begin with. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities, or some versions use the word varieties, of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And I know many of you are familiar with the common approach to this. The common approach to this passage of Scripture is to go down and to, to define uh, the, the ministry gifts, to to uh, describe the, minute, the gifts that are listed in verses 8 through 10 here, and, and to, in other words, to, to tell you how they look and what they should do, and so on and so forth. But uh, I don't believe that was all Paul's, at all Paul's intention. I don't believe that Paul was, uh, uh, was saying, uh, um, here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to count one to nine and then write a book. I'd like for you to count one to nine and then, and then uh, develop a, a, a spiritual gifts class for your Bible college or for your church Sunday school program. I don't think Paul was saying, hey, there's only nine, first of all. I think he was using kind of an example, you know, of many of the things that were uh, already prevalent in the church. But I also don't believe that he was trying to draw us into uh, defining job description in each and every one. You see what I'm saying? And that's been the, uh, the way I've seen it approached. I mean, we've been in the ministry a long time now, and, and I've been to some Bible schools, and I've been through many seminars and, and, and sat through many teachings and th- so, fo- so on and so forth. And I find that, you know, so many people feel that it's necessary to actually get into each one of these nine listed gifts here in 1 Corinthians 12 and begin to give definition. In other words, if you're going to operate in this gift, this is what it's supposed to look like and this is how it's going to operate, see? And to me, that is, uh, is robbing the whole concept of what Paul's trying to communicate here. As I say, I don't think he's really looking at, uh, at, at creating a job description format for us. I think that Paul's purpose is revealed for us more in, in these Uh, first few verses four through seven where he talks about diversities of gifts differences of ministries diversities or varieties of activities i think these are the key words diversity difference variety those are the key words that i believe paul's trying to communicate i think that i should say those words communicate the idea that he's trying to get across i don't think he's trying to draw us over to these nine gifts that are listed in eight through ten and say you know but this is (laughs) All there is to diversity and variety and difference. You hear that? See, it doesn't even make any sense. It seems to contradict. There are diversities of, he says, diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Difference of ministries, but the same Lord. Or that word ministries is administrations. Now listen to the broad context of what's really being said here. Paul says there are diversities of gifts. Lots and lots of gifts, he says. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that. And he says, but within the gifts, now listen, within each gift of the diversity of gifts, there are differences of administrations. Are you getting it? So what he's saying is that, that even when you identify a particular gift, you can pick out any gift you want to, that that gift is never going to look the same as it flows through different individuals. That gift is going to have a different look to it every time. There are differences of administrations to every gift of the diversities or the many gifts that are out there. And then he goes on and, and he adds to that. He even broadens our, our understanding even more. He says there are diversities of activities or uh, that word means operations or effects. So again, now we've just, we've just made this thing, you know, progress wonderfully out into the realm of, of infinite. So there, you, you, there, there are many, 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 many gifts. And each and every one of those many, 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 many gifts has a variety of expressions. And each of those expressions of those many, many gifts produces differences of operations or effects. So you getting the point? So how in the world can we go into a passage like verses 8 through 10 and stand up and say, now this is the gift, this is how it operates, this is what it's going to look like, and if it doesn't look like this, you're in some other gift and you need to be uh, restrained in church. 
It's like I told you last time, you know, don't be, if you're, if you're a little bit vague as to your giftings, as to your functions, as to what God is, has laid on your uh, life to, to do in order to contribute to the edification uh, of the body of Christ and to the, uh, our influence on the world, if you're a little bit vague, don't, don't try to uh, make yourself look like something you're familiar with. That's the biggest problem they have. Because you see, when you try to make yourself look like something you're familiar with around you, what you end up doing most of the time is is, uh, finding yourself in a place of frustration because you don't have the joy, you don't have the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the motivation in that particular thing. You hear what I'm saying? Because it only comes from what God has placed in your heart, the passion, the God's passion in your heart. That's the only thing that's going to express itself with joy. That's the only thing that's going to present itself to you as an opportunity rather than being used by God. And I've been into that a lot. I don't want to be used by God, but I enjoy all the opportunities he gives me to express his love and his gospel. But you know what? As I said last week, I don't want your opportunities. Pastors all over the world have consumed, and not necessarily because they wanted to, have consumed or taken upon themselves the opportunities of of, of the whole body of Christ. We've said, you sit there and listen to what I've got to say, then you go back to your job on Monday and I'll spend the rest of my week beating my brains out against the wall trying to meet the needs of people that you were designed to meet. That make sense? See? See? And so every week, all over the United States and all over the world, we have a tremendous, I mean, it's, it's an outrageous number of pastors who quit the ministry. And you know what the real uh, sad point of that is? That every time a pastor quits the ministry, many of the people drop out of church and never go back. And again, you know what? There are a lot of problems in the institutional church. But as I said last week, I'm for the institutional church, even though I sound like I'm speaking against it at times. I believe in the institution. I believe the institution needs reformation. I believe the institution, you know, needs to uh, open itself up and allow a lot of change. But anyway, let's look at this thing. So as I said, you know, there's there's some key words here. Uh, In verse 6, we see Paul saying, all in all. He's emphasizing all. In verse 7, he says, each one. Every one of you who's in each one, hold your hand up, please. If I don't see some hands out there, I'll, I'll begin to wonder. But anyway... He says, each one, and look what he says, each one for the profit of all. Isn't that right? He doesn't say one for the profit of all. He says each one for the profit of all. Isn't that right? And then in verse 11, he uses these words, each one individually. So, in other words, rather than to define and describe the gifts, I believe that Paul's main point is that each and every individual is gifted with necessary contributing functions that in combination result in the profit of all. In combination, they result in the profit of all. Different gifts served in various ways, producing a wide variety of effects. That's what Paul told us in verses 4 through 6 there, right? And only the free exercise of every function of the gifted. And who are the gifted? Each one, right? All in all, all right? Only the free exercise of the the gifted will produce God results. So again, it's, it's not the descriptive teaching of specific gifts that we need. In fact, in the descriptive teaching of these gifts, what we've actually done immediately is limit the expression. Isn't that right? Because if it says there are many gifts, and, 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 and each and every one of those gifts has a variety of, of displays producing a variety of effects, and yet I narrow you down to one, and I say, well, this is, you know, uh, you seem to be uh, operating in the gift of prophecy, so what I'd like to do is take you aside, and I would like to explain to you how the gift of prophecy works. And then what I do is I build into you the understanding of what I think prophecy is, and immediately, what, and, and you, you know, being the kind of, uh, you know, adoring, following people that you are, whatever Mike says is gospel truth, you know. So this is what Mike has said the gift of prophecy is to look like. And uh, then you try to make it look like that, and it just creates problems. 
See? And so what I've done is I've, I've distanced you, divorced you from being able to actually discover the gift of prophecy in your life. Now, I may have identified the initial gift, but I need to remember, every instructor needs to remember, everybody that you go to to ask, what, is it, what should it look like, needs to remember that no matter what your gift is, there's a variety of expressions producing a multiplicity of effects. Does that make sense to you? And so really what we want to do is we want to focus on Paul's real meaning here, okay? <clears throat> now, again, we need to be free of the idea that only some are gifted. That's one thing we've been working on for quite some time now, the idea that only some are gifted. You know, when I went to Bible school back in the 70s, I was almost immediately agree- greeted with the, uh, with the old covenant concept of touch not God's anointed. You know, the pastors from the Word of Faith outfit that I was associated with, they wanted to be... Uh, you know, uh, valued more highly than everyone else. They wanted to uh, have you believe that they were God's anointed. And of course, right from the beginning, I, you know, I realized that wasn't true. We're all God's anointed, right? And, uh, but anyway, <clears throat> we need to realize, in, you know, that not all are gifted. I mean, that all are gifted, that there's not a limitation on the gifted, first of all. So he said in verse 7 here, to each, what does the word each mean? Every right? To everyone, he said, for the profit of all. See, to each one for the profit of all. In other words, without the contribution of each and every one, all will not profit. The profit (laughs) will not be complete. Now, we're talking about P-R-O-F-I-T right now, okay? The profit will not be complete. And what is the alternative? The alternative is what we seem to be displaying in the church today. A minority for the limited benefit of the few. Right? Now listen, I will quickly acknowledge that I'm a part of that recognized minority. I don't want to do away with the minority. I'm not cutting my own throat with this thing, you know. I enjoy being a part of that, of that part that gets to teach in the body of Christ as part of my gifting, as part of my interaction with the body of Christ. I don't want to do away with that minority. I want to see that minority expanded to become what it's intended to be, just participators in the greater function of the church. It's like I've said many times, you know, I've never, never been able to tolerate the idea of identifying ourselves by some ministry gift, Apostle Paul. You know, he didn't call himself Apostle Paul. He called himself Paul an Apostle. See, when you take the, the big A and you make it a lowercase a, what you've done is you have made yourself one of many rather than establishing yourself and creating your identity with the capital A, right? And see, I've never liked the whole thing. See, I mean, in all the 40 years that Marilyn and I have been doing ministry work, I have never liked Pastor Mike. A lot of you don't like Pastor Mike either, but that's tough. <laughs> a lot of people didn't like Pastor Mike, left the church. So anyway, no, but you know what? I mean, I'm a pastor, when I'm pastoring. And as I've said many times before, when someone comes by my house and I, well, I don't do it anymore. I got sons that do it now. But I used to lay out under the, uh, you know, under the truck and change the oil, right? And somebody say, hey, Pastor Mike, I'm not pastoring right now. Probably I'm saying things that are not inappropriate to say anyway as I'm busting my knuckles underneath there. You don't want to take that as pastoral under- <laughs> care, you know what I'm saying? No, you're pastoring when you're pastoring. When are you prophesying? When you're prophesying, right? That's when a gift of... Okay, so anyway, enough said about that. But anyway, so as I said, the alternative, what we have now, uh, as opposed to each one for the profit of all, is a minority for the limited benefit of a few. Hmm. All right, go with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. I beseech you, therefore, brethren... Now, let me say this as I get into this, because I'd like you to go ahead and notice this as we get into it. There are several verses in this first few verses that we're going to look at, two or three verses here, that we continually lift out of their immediate context, and we use them appropriately, not inappropriately. Sometimes, I guess, we use them inappropriately, too. But we use them appropriately to apply to certain things. But I want you today to kind of look at the context in which Paul is speaking as we broaden our usage of this particular text. Look at this. He starts out, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each a measure of faith. Now, we've already encountered two. Have you recognized them? The first one was, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that's a passage of Scripture that I will continue to use to tell you, do not be conformed to what the world thinks about we've all got to be sick sometime. But you know what? That's not the context here. But it is a principle that applies. We're not to be conformed. We don't want to take upon ourselves the philosophies of the world and agree with them. The world says, well, this is terminal. The scripture says nothing's terminal. Scripture says there is healing love for all. The scripture says he healed all who were sick and all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with them, right? So we don't want to conform ourselves to what the world believes. So much of the church has done that, and it's been devastating to them on a personal and family and even broader sense than that, a corporate, a corporate um, perspective, you know. And now we're at this other passage in verse 3 that says, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. Okay, now again, that's a passage of Scripture that stands in agreement with Paul's additional revelation concerning the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to continue to use it that way. But what I want you to do today is to kind of distance yourself from the usual way that I would say those things to you and try to see how it fits in to the text as we go through here. All right, so for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. What does for mean? Because, right? So we've just attached what he's saying now to God hath hath given to each one the measure of faith. Because as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And we'll quit there for just now, but we're going to come back to a little bit more of this chapter in a minute. But first of all, In verse 3, I'd like you to notice that that Paul identifies his audience. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, he says he's speaking to everyone who is among you. Right? See those words? Everyone. I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you. In other words, this is not an address that's being delivered to an elitist minister's conference where you're only invited to attend if you can identify or prove yourself to be in full-time ministry. Whoops. Okay, so it's to everyone who is among you. The things that Paul is talking about are to everyone who is among you. Isn't that right? Okay. Now, so as we look then at verses 3 through 6 again, after telling us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, he reminds us that all the members do not have the same function. Now, as I said, we need to understand right away the connection between verse 3 and then verses 4, 5, and 6, because really, in the context here, they are inseparable, and yet we have separated them out. And again, I don't think the way, well, I I looked back over the way I've used it over the years, and I don't feel like that I've used it in an inappropriate way to take that third verse and talk about, uh, you know, that God hath given to each the measure of faith. I think that certainly is appropriate, but I want you to see how this actually ties into what Paul's trying to get to here. So he reminds us, you know, that all, not, that, that all the members do not have the same function. And so the caution here, first of all, in verse 3, what is it about? The caution is specifically against elevating the importance of my function above any other. Can you see the association here? In verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, right? But to think soberly as God has dealt to eat the measure of faith. And then he goes on and begins to talk about the members all having gifts, differing gifts that fun, uh, d- uh, functions, I mean, differing gifts and functions, right? 
So what's he talking about when he says, don't think more highly of yourself? He's talking about not thinking more highly of my gift, the expression of God's grace and love through me, than I do of your grace, of your, of your gift. You see what I'm saying? So that's the real caution right now, first and foremost, that we not allow ourselves to develop an elitist mentality or even a mentality of superiority or of, of more importance. Right, And yet that has been, it's particularly in some of the charismatic groupings that we have known and been, and again, you know what, I'm all for these. I thank God for the charismatic movement. I thank God for Dennis and Rita Bennett's book on uh, 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock? Nine o'clock. I, I, I missed it. I, was there. I got up early that day. Nine o'clock in the morning that, that, that introduced uh, me, you know, through their Episcopal uh, faith, uh, you know, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I thank God for these things. So when I speak about these things, I, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make adjustments along the way. And of course, adjustments normally cause us to reflect back on, we'll call them the errors of the previous cycle. Okay, but we don't want to become condemning of the previous cycle. We want to just allow that cycle to speak into our life and, and, and embrace the ideas that God is revealing to us now in order to build line upon line, precept upon precept. We were talking at lunch with Lloyd the other day and talking about how we have this tendency, you know, to begin to gather around and focus on certain things and just, you know, almost beat a dead horse at times. You know, but, but why do we do that? Well, because you see, back in the early 1900s, there was a, a Pentecostal renewal. A Pentecostal renewal and a charismatic renewal, two different things. And this Pentecostal outpouring, the Azusa Street revival and a lot of those things, that, 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 that introduced people once again to the, to, the absent, <laughs> to the absence of the Holy Spirit in their, in their understanding, in their doctrine. Obviously, he wasn't absent. He just was dormant because they weren't allowing him to be effectual in their lives. But they, but they had this concept that developed in that, that they must tarry for the Holy Spirit. And see, and so for a period of time, uh, even some of the people that we look back on and, uh, you know, and learn from, the John G. Lakes and the Smith Wigglesworths and some of those people who, who were further on down the line, uh, they tarried for the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, see, there was a misrepresentation in that. And so later on, you know, then there was the charismatic movement that came up later, much later on. And through the charismatic movement, and actually, prior to that, there was the healing movement, the Oral Roberts and the tent evangelists of the 40s and so on and so forth. But each generation or each grouping was, was, was actually building off of the, the, the good things from the previous generation, but also was trying to amend the things that did not come forward uh, in, in right revelation. You know what I'm saying? And so the, the charismatic movement came along and, and the charismatics began to realize that you didn't have to tarry for the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was a gift. Now, again, there was some misrepresentation of how the Holy Spirit was to be, you know, embodied in us and, how, and so on and so forth. But we see that happening. And then, and then the, all of a sudden, the, the, the teaching ministry came to the forefront. The Kenneth Hagins and the Gordon Lindsays and the Kenneth Copelands and some of the people that we've been familiar with, you know, on down through the, line, through the ages. And, and, you know, that's when I was first uh, called into the ministry, was through the teaching ministry emphasis, you know. And in the teaching ministry, we began to teach people about things that had been uh, blatantly missing from the charismatic movement. And they were teaching people things that had been blatantly missing from the healing revivals, who were in turn going back to the Pentecost, and so on and so forth. And so now today, we find ourselves, again, being, being uh, exposed to some things that God now says, okay, now we need to bring this out now in order to make this have its fullest meaning. Does all this make sense to you? I have a tendency to ramble, so you can just throw something at me if I'm rambling, okay? <laughs> Anyhow... I want, you, I want you to realize what's going on here, though. So, <clears throat> so as I said, the caution, though, is, is against elevating the importance of my function above any other, or in other words, esteeming my value to the body to be greater than yours. And you know, there's not a, there's not a one of us who hasn't had a period of time when we, uh, in some way or another, with, particularly with regard to our spiritual life, haven't esteemed the man up front or the woman up front more highly than we have ourselves. And to me, there's many humble people out there that don't want that. But there are many people who grab onto that and who it becomes their, their self-esteem to be the pastor. And you will call me Pastor Mike wherever, where you see me. 
right? I was standing in a restroom <laughs> many years ago and uh, using the facilities, and a young man from my church came in at the same time and stood at the facility right next to me, and he said, <laughs> My God, Pastor Mike. His name was Daryush. He was an Iranian Christian. I didn't know you needed to use the facilities. <laughs> he was being facetious, obviously, you know, because of my great anointing and the, you know, whatever. No. <laughs> But what he was really trying to do, he'd been exposed to some of the things we're talking about, you know, some of the excesses in, in hierarchical and elitist mentality in the church, and, and really got, was trying to make a point. There's a lot of these guys that act like they don't even have the same bodily functions the rest of us do, you know, they just go through life floating on, you know. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> Enough about that one. Okay. All right, so... <laughs> So because he's cautioning me not to value my, you know, to esteem my value to the body to be greater than yours, he, he quickly says, all members do not have the same function. But then he comes right back, if you look at that in the next verse or so, and he quickly adds that every member does have some equally vital function, right? We're not all the same, we're all different, but every one of us is equally vital, right? Now look at verse 5, he says, individually members of one another. You see that in verse 5? individually members of one another. So that means that when we use the terminology members of the body of Christ, we are not just to think in terms of ourselves being members of Christ, but of being individually members of one another. See, it's easy to do that, isn't it? It's easy to think Christ. It's easy to think spiritual. It's easy to think Jesus and dismiss you, dismiss one another right? But he says, no. He said, we are individually members of one another, which, which means, in other words, that everything we do has effect on everybody else in the body. We're inseparable in our influence. Now, you know what? R small ripples, I mean, big ripples begin with small stones. And so when I say that everything we do has, has influence on the whole body, I'm not just talking about here in the gathering of Father's house on Sundays and Wednesdays. Actually, I mean, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it, but what we do here creates ripples that touch other parts of the world, positively and negatively. And there's all of these overlapping rip ripples from all of the dissension and the, and the division and the separation that's in the body of Christ right now that's disabling the body of Christ from really having the influence of Jesus on the world around us. So we need to understand that. I mean, as we encounter these people who want to argue with us on Facebook about doctrine, these people who, who want to call us names, who want to do the things they do, just simply be, and we just don't want to become like them, like that, but we don't want to d discount these people. We want to realize that we are all individually members, one of another. The girl or the guy I don't like that wants to argue with me and, and, and all the time, I'm individually a member of her. She's individually a member of me. Isn't that right? Wow. Verse 6, he says, we have gifts. Look at verse 6 now. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Now, that's not a more or less grace gifting. You know, like we have gifts that differ. Some people get more grace. Some people get less grace. That's not what he's talking about there. And we'll be talking about this grace concept in, in, in the next lesson. But anyway, it's talking about diversity of abilities, but all of the same value. He said, we have gifts that differ according to the grace. You know, uh, let me just put it this way. You know, part, one of the grace, in, the, uh, grace in my life is to teach the, teach the, the gospel. So that's, a, that's an administration of grace from me to you, right? And, and so we all have diversities of grace. We've, every one of us has been gifted with a peculiar grace, or more than one, but I mean uh, with particular grace, a peculiar grace that, that is necessary for the profit of all. So when it says, according to the grace given to us, don't decide that some people, according to the measure of the grace, don't decide that some people have been given more grace and some people less grace, and don't let anybody talk you into that concept either. Because again, there are some up in the hierarchy of elitism that would, would want you to believe that about them. And again, for the most part, most are humble and most understand these things. But you know, a lot of people have been sucked in 
to feeling less of themselves than they ought to and to becoming ineffectual in their relational interactions with people because it's, well, you know, I think I need to take you to the pastor. That's why so many pastors have unlisted phone numbers. <laughs> you know, Marilyn and I have kept ours listed. I just, see, I just turn mine off. <laughs> no. Hers is always on. You can get her anytime you want. Anyway, let's see. So he's saying, no member without a necessary function, each function equally vital to the life and the health of the whole body, and so there are no superior giftings. So even with the saying that all are gifted, which I've heard many people say over the years, that all are gifted, there still can be this idea that there are superior giftings, all right? And so I want you to just go with me quickly over to 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Caleb taught out of this and, uh, a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. And, uh, but, but I do want to just, because this is a passage of Scripture that I have heard used in the past as a means of establishing the idea of certain gifts being superior to other gifts or more necessary to other gifts. And this is that passage that says, and God has appointed, and of course I read this particular scripture last week too, and God has appointed these in the church first. Well, we know who first is. First is the Seattle Seahawks, right? So that means, no, wait a minute. No, that's what I mean by that is, you see, the minute we hear first, we, at, we, est- we est- attach to that a priority of importance, don't we? Right. See? Secondly, Broncos. Anyway, yeah. I can't find the Dallas Cowboys anywhere in this list. Anyway, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> the casting out of evil spirits. I forgot that. <laughs> How many people did we just lose from the Texas area on our internet? <laughs> No, but look at this. God has appointed these in the church first, apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that, things begin to kind of go downhill. You know, so on and so forth. But here's the thing. If you, if you read through this, you know, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administration. Well, you can tell by the word helps that that's much less significant than apostles who are first, right? Now, here's the importance, you know. It's, it's important that we don't attach numerical values of significance on this. I think that it would be better understood, and this is the way I've always understood, well, I can't say always, but I mean for, for years I've understood it this way. I think it's better if we understand this in the sense of a, of a sequential construction process. And I've probably used something like this before, but when Marilyn first moved into our home, or actually when we first began to go by, drive by it as, as our home was being built, you know, the first group of people that we saw out there, were, and, and I'm not trying to be in any way racist, but was the Hispanic uh, foundation workers. Men who didn't speak any English, most of them, I couldn't communicate with them, you know. When I'd go by, they would wave, and they were very friendly, but I couldn't really communicate. But they were found First on the scene were the foundation layers, right? Apostles in here. They're the first ones on the scene. And then the next ones, you know, the next group that came in f- built flooring across the top of that foundation. And then the next ones were the framers, I'm making sure you notice that every one of these words starts with F. I'm doing a good thing here. And then the final group was the group we would have to identify as the finishers, right? Whether it be carpenters, plumbers, whoever they were. And you see, that's, so as I say, we understand this in a, con- in a construction sequence is much more appropriate. It may not be perfect, but it's much more appropriate than putting sequential value, priority value on people based on first, second, third, that kind of thing. That's not what it's about. There are no superior gifts. All right, anyway, go with me over to Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 to 8. I know you thought I was going to go down to the important verses, the one that talk about apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You thought I was going to go down there and say, now this is where I fit in, where do you fit in? But no, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another. Those are such big words there, bearing with one another. Those words mean to, to, to get under one another and to be supportive of one another. And, you know, we have a difficult time doing that because sometimes the, 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 the person that we're uh, observing is somebody who is exercising a gift in a way that we don't agree with. 
It's not according to anything I got in my, step, in my nine-step book or my nine-step teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And so I can't get under that. I can't bear with that. I'm going to have to kind of discard that idea. You know what I'm saying? This bearing one another, I did a teaching strictly on it years ago, and I remember what a powerful statement it was. He was actually, Paul was actually speaking to the very thing we're speaking to right now and telling people, look, there are things going on around you that you will not understand because it hasn't been given to you to understand. It's been given to that person to, to, to minister that way or it is that given to this person to do this with. And you need to undergird these people and say, look, even though you're operating in a way that I don't understand it. Now, again, you know, there's balance in all this, obviously. We're not talking about foolishness and stupidity. Some things are easily identifiable as being out of line. No question about it. But, I mean, there's so much that happens, it just gets discounted. And oftentimes, or most of the time, it's by the so-called clergy up front. It's by the up front guy that says, that's not allowable, that's different. See? But we've tried to open ourselves up always to, to allow the different to speak into our lives. See? I know some of you here are aware of the differences in the way Barbara ministers. Well, Barbara, I, I see Barbara as a true gift of the Spirit operating in our church. And some of you look at Barbara and, and, you, and you know, you're all gracious, but you all think, I wonder what that is. Don't they, Barbara? People have said that, haven't they? You've been asked to leave churches before, haven't you? Well, isn't that the saddest thing in the world? And this woman and, and Mark together have n done nothing but bless everybody in this church and bless me. But, you know, just because things are just a little bit different than what we're familiar with or the way people have operated or existed around us, you know, we feel like we've got to defend our territory lest it be invaded by somebody of difference. That's true doctrinally. That's true, you know, functionally in the body of Christ. See, I'm being shot at now. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, let's go on. <laughs> okay, he said, so with all lowliness, that would be humility and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring, what? Endeavoring. To... <coughs> what, is that something on my. Do we know what that is? Yes, Lord. <laughs> endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given. Remember the previous passage we looked at in Romans. According to the measure of Christ's gift, the measure. Maybe I should move it. Okay, I'll just keep on. Yeah, this is the helps ministry we were talking about earlier. <laughs> it's a gift, right? <laughs> Truly is when you're as uh, intellectually, I mean, as well that too, but I mean, as uh, electronically challenged as I am. But anyway. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity to captivity. He gave gifts to men. Now, in this short passage here, the thing that's conspicuous by his absence is any mention of doctrine specifically. You notice that? It's really not about doctrine. Paul's not talking about doctrine. And as I said, you know, I did some, some study years ago that... Uh, showed me even more about how this is really speaking into or being supportive of one another in our different administrations of the functions of the body of Christ. So, but, but the more obvious here is the preservation of unity through the acknowledgement and the support of diverse gifts and functions. That's really what Paul's speaking into here. That's what he is, is uh, prefacing some of the remarks that he leads into later regarding the ministry. He starts off talking about, you know, this, and it's more important to him, apparently, than doctrine, you know. Now, as I said last week, you know, certainly doctrine is of the utmost importance. We're, obviously, we, we teach doctrine here. We believe doctrine here. Uh, really, that's kind of saying the same thing twice because doctrine means teaching. So we teach teaching here. <laughs> we teach teach here. But, it, but, I, but as I said, you know, I believe that being deprived of opportunity, of expression, you know, of meaning is, the, is, 
is the greater influence on the, uh, on the current trend away from and in criticism of the institutional church. I think more people are pulling away from the church and, and, and speaking evil of the institutional church uh, because of the inability to, to contribute or to be involved. You know, the only contribution we allow you to make is to, in the offering plate, or the only contribution that, that we encourage you to make is to clean the church or to, or to do this, that, or the other thing to take the burden off of our back, you know. And, uh, you know, I think people are leaving the church as much, at least as much over that as they are over doctrine. And we need to realize the value of, of this thing, see? So, without the free exercise of our differing functions, you know, there really is no unity, is what he's saying here. And the, consequently, the power in the church is diminished as well. Now, what the ministerial elite don't realize is that they're actually rejecting the, uh, the revelation of Christ because, you see, it requires the whole body to fully manifest Christ. And I remember years ago when I began to see this, I thought, you know, I want the full revelation of Christ to be operative in me, around me, to the people I fellowship with. And how can that be? And, and I, I became immediately aware of my in, inability to fully manifest Christ. And I realized it's the body that manifests. You know, it's like... Um, who was talking to me last week about it? Who was that talking to me about on the Adams family? Somebody was talking to me about it. Remember it on the Adam? Maybe it was on the phone I was talking to somebody. Remember it? Everybody went to it for direction. It was a hand. That's all it was. It was a hand. <laughs> See? And, and that's where they were getting all of their direction, all their leadership, all their guidance was from the hand. How ineffective is that? I mean, of course, that was you know, meant to be facetious and everything. But, but that's what's happened. So often in the church. So as, as I said, the, 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 we have in, in, in effect, we have rejected the, the revelation of Christ without intending to, without meaning to, because it takes the whole body to fully manifest Christ in the earth. That makes sense to you? Can you agree with that? I mean, if you're agreeing with that, you're saying that I'm going to begin to actually ask God what I'm supposed to be or what, what will fulfill me, not what I'm supposed to be doing. That puts it back in that other category. I don't mean it that way. But what he has, what passion he has placed in my heart that will be nourished as it flow, you know, will nourish others and also nourish me as it flows out of me, refresh me. So when you say you agree with me, you're saying, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to be content to be, you know, uh, what did uh, Don Francisco say in that song that we played a few weeks ago? Half-baked pew potatoes. So I'm not going to be a half-baked pew potato anymore. <clears throat> Go with me back to Romans chapter 12 again now. And I'm not going to read this portion of it again, but in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8 are, are most commonly referred to for the same purposes that uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10 were, for the purpose of identifying and describing the particular gifts. Uh, one lady years and years ago who was big in the ministry, and uh, she decided that she was going to label, and I think it started with her, that she labeled the gifts in Romans chapter 12 as the motivational gifts. I don't know if it started with her, but she brought that out, you know. And then, of course, in, the, in Corinthians, we have the gifts of the Spirit, and, in, and then in... Uh, Ephesians, we have the ministry gifts, as though there are three different classifications of gifts, and that just ought to strike you as foolish if you've gone this far with me on this thing by now. Anyway, but as I said, you know, these verses are normally referred to in an effort to help people find their gifting and begin to uh, understand how their gift is supposed to operate. But Paul's purpose to me was, was, uh, was much higher. Because I think his purpose throughout this 12th chapter, and we're going to look at it a little more intent in, a minute, in, in depth in a minute, but his main concern was the relational development of the body. Not the functional assignments of the body, but the relational development of the body as a result of discovering your functions. That makes sense to you? See, when I read this 12th chapter, I see Paul subordinating gifts and functions to the building of right relationships. Ooh, wow. See, what we've done is we have subordinated many times the building of right relationships to the gifts and functions. How many times, I don't need an answer because I know, how many times have people left this church because I either couldn't or wouldn't give them the position that they were demanding? 
See, they had made, and they were people that until that moment arose, they professed to be very relationally involved with the church. But the minute they weren't able to uh, hang on to or grab on to the particular position, I'm using the word position, but in this church that they wanted, they were gone. What did they do? They had subordinated <laughs> relational interaction to their gift, to their giftings, to their positions. You see what I'm saying? I love these people, and I run into them and speak to them and, and embrace them still. But to me, the, the most important thing that Paul is trying to bring out in all of these passages that we're looking at, and including, of course, the, the, the basis of this whole series out of Hebrews chapter 10, is, is relational interaction. Developing, you know, the, 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 uh, the interactions in the body of Christ. Now, we, we obviously need to develop both. We need to develop both relationships, and we need to develop our gifts and functions but we need to realize that relationships supersede personal accomplishments. Now listen, on the one hand, relationships only grow through mutual giving and receiving. Would you all agree with that? On the natural level, right? I mean, if there was not a mutual reciprocal giving and receiving between Marilyn and I, our, our, our relationship would never have grown. It would have just remained stagnant. Isn't that right? And so put this in any context you want to, but let me say it again. On the one hand, relationships only grow through mutual giving and receiving, and that is what? Ministry. That's ministry, isn't it? That's serving one another. Remember, servant, uh, ministry, diakonos, minister, servant, table waiter, errand runner. Those are some of the definitions that Strong gives. I'm sure there are other definitions as well to go with that Greek word. But anyway, but on the other hand, your ministry is only as effective as the sincerity of the relational component. You see that? You see how the relational component becomes more important than the actual gift. I mean, how many people are really feel relationally bonded to a pastor that stands up in, in, in the pulpit every week and beats you over the head with law, tells you how sinful you are, how, how worthless you are, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then, and then to make matters worse, he steps out the, well, there's no back door here, but he steps out the back door, gets in his car and goes home so that you won't have to inter- be able to interact with him. Now listen, the church is full of people like that full of ministries like that. The relational component is the most important component. We can tolerate people who don't always agree with us doctrinally if, if, if we're walking in love with one another. See, I've sat and listened to ministers that, that I don't agree with a lot of what they say, but gosh, I love the person. The person's so loving and kind and so interactive with other individuals, you know, that who can throw them out the back door? See what I'm saying? And so understand, they both need to be developed, but the most important thing is the development of the relational, con- uh, relational uh, component. See, focus on gifting detracts from relational awareness, doesn't it? All right? But on the other side, <laughs> relationship focus enhances our gifts. See, the more I love you, the more I care about you, the more I'm involved in your life. In, 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 as a teacher, I can tell you this for a fact. The more I care about you, the more I'm concerned about being able to find in Scripture those things that will minister to your needs and actually build you up and fulfill you. Isn't that right? If I I don't really care about you, if I'm just doing one of two things, just uh, just preaching in order to develop my own um, um, uh, CDs and and so on and so forth, you know, to promote my own ministry, well, then I'm just going to get up here week after week after week, and I'm just going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'm not going to give it any thought about what do they need to hear or what might bless this people. See what I'm saying? So if, I, if I'm not relationally bonded to you first and foremost, then my gift loses its effect in this church or any place else I go. Same way, in, I mean, in, in my relationship with Marilyn, her relationship with me. If we're not relationally bonded, then, then our functions as husband and wife, our functions and, our, and the roles that we have chosen to play in our own homes with regard to the things we do really don't mean anything. You know, I can say to Marilyn, look, you know, every time your car's low on gas, I go gas it up. And, and every time there's trash in the, in the tank, I take it out. And I clean the garage, and I do this, and I do that. But, then if, but if I'm not relationally involved with Marilyn, if I don't love my wife, if I don't care about her on all the other, then all those things I do are totally unimpo- unimportant, aren't they? Who cares about my functions if I don't have a relationship with my wife? All right? Okay. <clears throat> Now, when Paul cautioned us not to think more highly than we ought, he was referring to regarding any gift more highly than another, as I said, but it wasn't for the gift's sake. (laughs) 
It was because esteeming contribution or position, listen to me, always results in esteeming some men higher than others, right? And consequently, that means we devalue other relationships. See, I can't esteem somebody more highly than another without what? What happened to this person? I disesteemed them, didn't I? And you see, the will of God, and that's what Paul's teaching in Romans 12, is that we value all men equally and greatly. That's his will, right? Now, when Paul said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed in its immediate context, like I said a while ago, when he said that, he was preparing the way for what he was about to say. Because what he was about to do in the rest of this 12th chapter is to introduce us to a, I'll call it a heavenly system of esteeming one another. So he said, don't be conformed to this world in the way you esteem one another, in the way you value one another, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to a heavenly system, to a God system of valuing and esteeming one another. All right? Because you see, this world does what? This world esteems men according to education, you know, societal status, you know, profession, wealth, those kind of things. But look, look at three quick scriptures. Let me James 2, 1 to 4. We got that? Let's just read these quickly and kind of see what the, get, give Paul some, uh, some backing here. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other, for who makes you differ from one another? In other words, where did you get the idea you're different than anybody else? That's what he said. He's not saying, who was it that made you better than somebody else? He's just saying, where did you get the idea that you differ from anyone else? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not... If you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it, but in other words, had attained it unto yourself, and so on and so forth? And then the last one here I want to read is just Matthew chapter 20. And boy, if we don't all know this one, I mean, we have never been in church, I guess, but 25 to 28. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who... Our great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. For whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, so what Paul's about to do, and he, what he wants us to understand in Romans 12, is the will of God concerning relationships. And he wants us to recognize that ministry simply happens in that setting. Instead of trying to manufacture ministry, it just happens in settings of, of relational interaction, doesn't it? All right, now go back to Romans chapter 12. I know this is going a little long. I, for, I had forgotten, Caleb told me, and I had forgotten that uh, we have, we're going to have speakers here today, and, and I, otherwise I would have prepared this slightly different, but I have a stopping point here in, in view. I can see clearly now. <laughs> okay. We don't need to reread verses 1 and 2 because we've talked about that. Do not be conformed to this world and so on. But now, with that in mind, I want you to go down to verse 9. And let me read a little bit so that you can see where Paul was going from the very beginning of this. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging and diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing <clears throat> to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. 
Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. This is how you take vengeance on your enemy, by the way, right? For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice he didn't say one thing about doctrine in that passage, did he? One, one thing about doctrine. See, what we're supposed to renew our minds to is what? A different way of value and esteem in our relationships. That's what the whole thing he was talking about when he said, don't be conformed to this world. Don't see people the way the world sees them. Don't judge them. Don't value them the way the world values them. Value them according to the way God values them, right? Now, in verse 3, when Paul cautioned us against, uh, you know, thinking more highly of ourselves, he was also cautioning us against evaluating ourselves by the world's standards. In other words, don't let your gifts, and you'll have to hear this, folks, because this happens all the time, don't let your gifts become a means of gaining acceptance in the church, of drawing attention to yourselves, in other words, the gifts and ministries that we have aren't to serve as measurements of our self-worth. And yet many times that's, that's happened with people. See, seeking gifts for the sake of acceptance and self-esteem isn't the answer. And, yet, and this is another one of those places where I don't blame the body. I blame the, 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 the ministry, the upfront ministry. Because people have begun to feel so insignificant and so devalued in the body of Christ that they begin and they begin to see someone someone who's allowed to stand up and give a prophecy someone who's allowed to do this that or the other thing and they say you know that person and they see people congregating around that person after the service and talking to them the way you talk to pastors in churches see same thing let's go talk to the person who seems to be the most significant and they see that and they say, you know, the best way I can remedy this is for me to find out my gift and begin to speak out loudly in tongues in church or to prophesy some foolishness possibly. Now, there's place for all these things. I'm not against these things. Obviously, you know that. And so what they begin to do is, is exercise what they think is a proper exercise of a gift for the purpose of, you know, finding some acceptance in the crowd. Hey, I'm all for them being accepted in the crowd, Right? We want them, but we've got to make the changes from the other side. We can't do it by, uh, by misappropriating, so to speak, right? So determine to develop meaningful relationships, and you'll discover that ministry happens. Determine to develop meaningful relationships. Am I telling you not to seek the understanding of your gifts? No. I'm going to conclude with this little sequence here. If you'll just go quickly to 1 Corinthians 12, you'll, you'll be within a page here of... I'm going to show you that I am not in any way encouraging you not to seek to understand your gifts, but just to realize the purpose for your gifts. All right, first of all, we have this in, in chapter 12 and verse 31. Earnestly desire the best gifts. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? And yet I show you a more excellent way. And then in chapter 13 and verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass, and you know the context, I won't read it all, but what he's saying is, you know, the more ex he's shown us the more excellent way. What is the more excellent way? Caring relationships. Right? And then he goes through all of that chapter, which you're familiar with. And then if you go back down to chapter 14 and verse 1, per pursue love <laughs> and desire spiritual gifts. So he says, pursue the best gifts. I'll show you a more excellent way. Love, caring relationships. And, oh, and by the way, don't forget to pursue gifts. See what I'm saying? So there's a balance here that he wants us to have. All right, so daily, house to house, and in the corporate gathering. So this isn't about, as I said, making time for everything to happen once a week in a central location. What it's about is recognizing the value and the capacity of every person on a daily interactive basis. Amen? Getting out of that? Amen.